Opposition leader Anthony Albanese has outlined a bold plan to bring high-speed rail to the east coast of Australia. 40 years. That's how long Australia has been talking about high-speed rail. 40 years of studies, reports, feasibility analyses and political promises. And nothing. Not a single kilometre of track. Until now. Because something's different this time. Something that might actually make it real. Sydney to Newcastle. 194 kilometers of what could become Australia's first true high-speed rail line. This is an actual project with funding, investigations underway, and a timeline that puts trains on tracks by the late 2030s. So, why now? Why this route? And after four decades of broken promises, why should anyone believe this time is different? Let's find out. The story starts in 1984. That's when Australia first got serious about high-speed rail. The CSIRO came up with this ambitious vision called the Very Fast Train. Sydney to Canberra to Melbourne. Everyone backed it. The public loved the idea, and politicians nodded along enthusiastically. And then, nothing happened. The project died, but the dream didn't. Over the next 40 years, Australia would spend over $150 million on studies, reports, feasibility analyses, and business cases. Each time, the conclusion was roughly the same. Yes, high-speed rail could work. Yes, it would be beneficial. Yes, it's technically feasible. But each time, the price tag kept growing. In 2000, one study estimated costs at up to $47 billion. By 2013, a comprehensive East Coast network study ballooned to $114 billion. New South Wales alone spent $100 million on planning before shelving the entire thing in 2022. That's $100 million on planning for something that never got built. The pattern became predictable. A new government comes in, orders a new study, and gets shocked by the cost. Kicks it down the next presidency. Repeat. And here's the thing. The problem was never technology. High-speed rail works brilliantly all over the world. Japan's Shinkansen has been running since 1964. France's TGV connects cities at 320 kilometers per hour. Spain, China, South Korea, they have all built extensive networks. The problem here was politics. Australian governments kept treating high-speed rail like a business investment that needed to turn a profit. But that's not how nation-building infrastructure works. Nobody built the Sydney Harbour Bridge expecting it to pay for itself in 10 years. Just like the Snowy Mountain Scheme wasn't a commercial venture, great infrastructure is about unlocking growth, creating opportunity, and connecting people. And yes, the economic returns come, but over generations, not quarterly reports. So. What's different this time? Strategic thinking, that's what. Instead of trying to build 1,700 kilometers from Sydney to Melbourne in one go, this proposal focuses on something achievable, Sydney to Newcastle. Just 194 kilometers. And it's not random. This route was chosen very deliberately. First, it's the busiest travel corridor in Australia. Nearly 15 million rail passengers every year over 40 million total trips when you include cars. This isn't building infrastructure hoping people will use it. This is building it where demand already exists and is struggling to keep up. Second, the entire route sits within New South Wales. One state, one government, and one budget. So there's no interstate political battles. Anyone who's watched Australian politics knows how hard it is to get states to agree on anything. Removing that variable alone makes this project dramatically more feasible. Third, the distance is perfect for high-speed rail. Currently, Sydney to Newcastle takes about two and a half hours by train. That's too long for easy commuting, but too short to justify flying. High-speed rail hits the sweet spot. One hour. City center to city center. No security lines or baggage hassles. Just get on and go. This is the proof of concept strategy. Build the most viable section first, demonstrate that it works, generate political momentum, and then extend it. Newcastle to Brisbane, Sydney to Canberra, and eventually, the full East Coast network.
But here's where things get really complicated. You can't just lay tracks on the surface between Sydney and Newcastle. The geography won't let you. First, you've got the Hawkesbury Sandstone, you've got river crossings, and you've got the Coastal Escarpment, a steep area that makes surface routes impossible for trains traveling at 320 kilometers per hour. You see, high-speed trains need gentle grades, smooth curves, and dedicated tracks with no interference from commuter trains or freight. You can't have them sharing space with regular rail traffic. So, the solution? Go underground. Dig 115 kilometers of tunnels. But here's the thing. That's not actually 115 kilometers of drilling. High-speed rail needs twin tunnels, one for each direction. So it's really 230 kilometers of tunnel boring through solid rock. And some of these tunnels are super long. One proposed section would be a continuous 38-kilometer tunnel. That would rank among the longest rail tunnels on Earth. For context, the channel tunnel between England and France is about 50 kilometers. This would be in that league. And it's not just long, it's deep. Some sections would be drilled deeper than a 40-story building beneath the surface. That's deeper than most subway systems and most urban infrastructure anywhere in the world. What makes this even more complicated is that Hawkesbury Sandstone is hard but also fractured and unpredictable. Engineers are already drilling boreholes, 27 of them so far, some reaching 140 meters deep, to study rock conditions before they even think about starting actual construction. So, what happens if they build it? The plan is for state-of-the-art trains traveling at 320 kilometers per hour. Sydney to Newcastle, currently two and a half hours. With high-speed rail, about one hour, maybe less. Central Coast to Sydney, currently a painful commute that can take 90 minutes or more, depending on delays. With high-speed rail, 30 minutes. Suddenly, living on the Central Coast or in Newcastle while working in Sydney becomes realistic. And capacity? These aren't small trains. We're talking 200 to 300 meters long, carrying 520 to 780 passengers per trip. That's roughly equivalent to two jumbo jets on rails. Every departure is moving the same number of people as two fully loaded 747s. But there's a catch. And it's a big one. The Sydney Station Dilemma. Where do the trains stop in Sydney? This might sound like a simple question, it's not. This decision will shape Sydney's growth for the next century. There are two main options and both have serious trade-offs. Option one, a deep station at Sydney Central, right in the CBD, maximum convenience. You step off the high-speed train and you're in the heart of the city. But here's the problem. Sydney Central is already one of the busiest stations in Australia. And carving out a cathedral-sized station beneath it for high-speed platforms? insanely expensive and complex. The engineering alone would be a nightmare. Option two, a Western hub, somewhere like Olympic Park or Rose Hill, much cheaper and easier to build. What's more, it would support Parramatta's growth as Sydney's second CBD. And it also aligns with long-term urban planning that's trying to reduce Sydney's dependence on the Eastern CBD. But it's indirect. Anyone heading into the city center would need to transfer. That means getting off the high-speed train and taking the metro or the regular train, which adds another 20 or 30 minutes to their journey. That convenience factor matters. If high-speed rail requires a transfer, some people will just drive instead. The whole point is to make rail the obvious choice. So, which option wins? Nobody knows yet. That decision is still being debated. Let's talk about the elephant in the room, cost. Current estimates put the project at 30 to $40 billion, maybe more. Some previous studies priced individual sections alone at nearly $32 billion. That's a staggering amount of money. The federal government has already committed $500 million for planning and corridor protection. That includes $79 million just for the business side, and that's already drawing criticism. $79 million for consultants to write reports? People are furious, but here's the reality. In projects this big, planning costs are massive. Starting with the land where this massive project will be built on, that's where a huge chunk of the budget goes. Estimates suggest that 20 to 30% of the total cost could be land acquisition. In Sydney's insanely expensive estate market, buying a continuous corridor for surface rail would cost a fortune. 
which is why tunneling, despite being expensive, might actually be cheaper. You drill deep underground beneath existing properties. You don't need to buy whole suburban blocks. You just need subsurface rights, which are far less expensive. And here's the critical part. The land corridor needs to be protected now, right now. Before development makes it impossible, if the government waits another decade, that corridor might be filled with high-rise apartments, shopping centers, and industrial parks. Then what? You'd either have to pay absurd amounts to demolish recent construction or abandon the project entirely, but people are skeptical. And you can't blame them. Australians have watched mega-projects blow out spectacularly. Inland Rail, a freight project connecting Melbourne and Brisbane, saw its cost triple from under $10 billion to over $30 billion, and it's still not finished. Melbourne's Metro Tunnel, same story. So when politicians promise high-speed rail for $30 to $40 billion, people roll their eyes. They've heard it before. They assume the real cost will be $60 billion or $80 billion or that it'll never happen at all. And then there's the technology question. Why not maglev? Why not hyperloop? Why stick with old high-speed rail technology? Here's why. Maglev is faster, yes, but it's vastly more expensive, and it's completely incompatible with existing rail infrastructure. It's a standalone system that requires everything to be built from scratch. Hyperloop, still science fiction. Not a single commercial hyperloop exists anywhere in the world. But high-speed rail is proven. It works. It's running in dozens of countries. That's why it's the only realistic option. So, when could this actually happen? The final business case was due by the end of 2024. That's when the government got the full picture. We are talking about detailed costs, engineering plans, economic projections, environmental impacts, everything. If approved, construction could start around 2027. That's the best case scenario. And if construction starts in 2027, first trains could be running in the mid to late 2030s. The year 2037 has been mentioned as a target opening. That sounds like forever. But for a project this big, it's actually realistic. Major infrastructure takes time. The Channel Tunnel took seven years to build, and that was with construction happening simultaneously from both ends. But imagine it does happen. Imagine those trains start running in 2037. Who wins? First, the Central Coast and Hunter regions. Right now, they're separate from Sydney economically. Suddenly, Newcastle won't be a distant city. It's a one-hour train ride that unlocks massive growth potential. Second, commuters. Daily travel times get transformed. People get hours of their lives back. Third, Australian engineering. A project this big creates a generation of mega project experience. That capability doesn't disappear when the project finishes. It gets applied to the next big thing and the next. Fourth, the environment. High-speed rail produces far lower emissions than cars or planes. If even a fraction of current road trips shift to rail, the carbon savings add up fast. It's not everything, but it's significant. So here we are, 40 years after the dream started. And now, once again, Australia is talking about high-speed rail. Is this the nation-building project the country has waited four decades for? The infrastructure investment that finally happens? Or is it another multi-billion dollar fantasy that disappears after the next election? In 2037, we'll know. Until then, fingers crossed that this time, the bet actually pays off. What are your thoughts on this project? Let us know in the comments. We reply to each and every one of you.